Hello and welcome to the ONS Energy Talks and the topic today is sustainability and climate actions during times of uncertainty. My name is Nashita Dawsalheim. I am the author of the Leadership PIN Code and CEO of Progressing Minds. I'm going to be your host today in this interview. And our guest today is Bjorn Haugland, who is the CEO of SHIFT. So I'd like to welcome Bjorn. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. You're really welcome. So tell us a little bit, Bjorn, for, for the audience's interest, what is SHIFT and what are the ambitions of SHIFT at this time? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, SHIFT is a, um, is a business uh, platform of companies and business leaders who really would like to accelerate the transition to a low carbon future with their companies. Um, so the ambitions for, for SHIFT is, is basically to support those companies and the government of Norway to ensure that we reach our climate targets. Uh, but for the companies, these are much more about building competitive uh, advantages. So by doing projects together, by being inspired uh, by each other to work across different um, business sectors um, and to learn from each other is really the core of, of SHIFT. So it is um, top management driven um, and we do network activities, we do projects together. And we also have a very uh, effective dialogue with our governments and uh, basically to point on solutions, either uh, regulatory solutions, technical solutions and other solutions that we can build together in order to really build Norway as a, as a laboratory of sustainable solutions. And so how... How are you all doing in these times, both personally and in terms of this initiative? Because it's it's putting a lot of pressure and presenting a lot of challenges, particularly with the low oil price as we see it right now. Yeah, this is definitely very special times for all of us. Um, and, uh, and obviously it is very difficult times for many uh, of us. And, uh, uh, the business sector is <laughs> is really struggling uh, these days. So, so that is obviously the the context of of uh, this um, uh, talk today. Uh, saying that, and in a broader and longer perspective, uh, personally, I think uh, you know this situation. This was a warned crisis. Uh, we were not prepared for it. Uh, scientists has warned us about it for many years. So I think it is a for humanity about uh, how we have to find ways of living where we are much more in harmony with nature um, and with it, each other. So so. In, in sense of, of what I'm working with uh, to find, uh, you know, robust ways for a sustainable future. I think actually the Corona crisis and the moment we're into just now will help us to reorient the way we are organizing our business, the way we are doing our leadership, the way we are doing our, our meetings, uh, our traveling, and so on and so forth. So, so I think this will be a turning point, and I think it will be a turning point for the world, for a more sustainable world going forward. So I hear a lot of optimism in what you're sharing there, that things will continue to move towards a greener future, and certainly the ambitions that you're describing for SHIFT will be realized. Could I ask you to look a little bit into the crystal ball with me and share some maybe just perspectives or insights from those businesses who are part of this cluster? What do they see actually changing? What would be some of those concrete changes we might see after the crisis is over when it comes to travel, for example, or businesses and, and their models? Yeah, well, I think for all of us, this has been kind of a crash training in, in digitalization. Uh, many of the tools we are using just now or have used the, the last weeks, they has been around us for, uh, for the last decade. We have used them now and then, 
But still, our main modus of operandum has been the, call it the old fashioned uh, way of traveling, meeting each other, and so on and so forth. So I think over the last weeks, we have seen the potential of living our lives more efficient, operate our businesses more efficient. So many of the companies I'm working with in, in Shift are very curious about how can we, after the crisis, um, learn from the period we have been through and see how we can incorporate this more and more <coughs> in our business model uh, going forward. So, so I think this is a huge learning potential for us. Um, uh, and I think those companies who are really curious about understanding how we can take advantage of operating with less foot footprint, with less resources, uh, will be the winners uh, going forward as well. And do you see now that, given the journey we've been on with the sustainability agenda, now the crisis seems to be putting even more, let's say, pressure and opportunity on that agenda. Are we moving fast enough or do you think we could be doing even more right now? Yeah, so we, we're definitely not moving fast enough. Um, the corona crisis, I would say, is a limited crisis, a small crisis compared to the climate crisis and the nature crisis. Those two crises we still has, have in front of us. Uh, they will be much more challenging for us to solve. All three crises, and particularly the climate crisis and the nature crisis, will first and foremost hit the youth and the next generations. So I think it's very important for, for us, uh, people who are in position just now, to realize that perspective, take learning from the corona crisis, and make sure that we now start really to prepare ourselves in order to also flatten the curve when it comes to the climate crisis and the nature crisis. And the most important thing we can do, definitely, is to limit the emissions of CO2. The sustainability agenda is much broader than the climate agenda. But still, climate change will be a big barrier reaching the other 17 sustainability goals. So we should focus on all of them, but we need really a particular focus on climate change. And we need to do whatever we can in order to do a fast decarbonization of the world. So have you seen some significant gains or achievements already that you think, OK, that's taking us in the right direction. I'm really satisfied with what we're doing there. Yeah, and that is the good news. I see so many good examples all over the world every day. Um, and, and, and just to give you a couple of examples, I, I work a lot with universities, uh, both in Norway and globally. And I see that the research agenda the project the students would like to work with, I would say, is 100% these days related to solving some uh, societal challenges, sustainability challenges. That just gave me a very clear indication that the generation coming after us will have this on a much higher priority than our generation have today, and we had 20, 30 years ago. So that's, that's number one. I also see that the business sector is really moving ahead on the sustainability agenda. Uh, again, also in the business sector, we see you know, new leaders taking positions and forming a totally different tone of voice in these companies on how sustainability is moving you know, from a 
corner office uh, into the core of the strategy, into the boardroom and into the business models uh, in order to make growth, in order to make trust to all stakeholders. And very importantly, in order to be able to attract the best minds into their companies. So sustainability is becoming very much integrated. And, and obviously, then we have plenty of examples within the tra transportation sectors. It's a huge shift from fossil fuels cars to, to uh, electric cars and zero emission cars. We see the same on, on buses. Here in Norway, we have a very strong maritime sector, and that is doing a lot of investments now to move the maritime sector over for zero emissions technologies. And, uh, and to be honest with you, in Norway, we are also starting to look at our airspace and see how we can also be the first country in the world which uh, implement fully electric uh, uh, air transportation. So. Plenty of examples, and um, and, and that's why uh, what really you know uh, <laughs> make me uh, very optimistic every day. The idea, the idea of electric air transportation is something that I find particularly fascinating. Where are we in in the journey of actually reaching that as perhaps something that becomes the main way that we we travel through the air? It's a good question. Um, uh, you know, just to give you a, a, a very, you know, kind of answer on, on your question, I think it's still kind of a decade away, uh, maybe more, uh, 10 to, to 20 years away. But, but obviously already today, we have smaller uh, uh, airplanes uh, already in operation. We have uh, small airplanes for, uh, for, uh, in, for, for, for education of pilots and so on. Uh, I think that the next generation electric airplanes, they will not look like the airplanes we have today because the fact that they are with zero emission and zero noise will also make it possible for them to to move into the cities again. So we don't need a long travel from the city center to the airport. We can have smaller vehicles, air vehicles, which, which transport us from the cities, maybe to, to airports, which take us then on, on bigger uh, aircrafts uh, uh, intercontinental. So this, this shift is not only about, you know, the same kind of air transportation as we have today with zero emission, I think we will see drones. I think we will see drones for passengers. I, I think we will see uh, autonomous drones. I think we will see air transportation much closer to where people live. Uh, and, and that is a fascinating shift in how we travel, obviously not only in the air, but also with other public transportation means in the cities. The cities are getting bigger. More and more people are moving into the cities. And we need to solve the transportation challenges within and between the cities very much different uh, going forward. And, uh, and uh, there we will see a lot of, of changes also in, in, in uh, air transportation. So when I'm listening to you there, Bjorn, I'm hearing that much of what you're describing is technically possible. We have, it sounds like at least, the competence and the, the ability to get there. So perhaps the question then just leads straight into what do business and policymakers need to do, in your view, to help us to get there faster and more efficiently? Well, um... First and foremost, your statement is correct. Most of the solutions are here today. Also within energy production, we, we know how to, you know, to make uh, zero emission energy from, from solar, from wind, and so on and so forth. So most of the technical solutions are here today. Obviously, many of the solutions are not that kind of cost competitive uh, than solutions that we have developed over the last hundred years. 
So I think the most important thing policymakers and the governments can do is first and foremost to make a clear vision of where we are going. Secondly, make sure that we implement a regulatory framework, a tax system, incentive system that kind of make benefits solutions we need to get in place. And we add more tax on the solutions we would like to get rid of. So, you know, in Norway, we have the highest density of electric cars in the world. Why? Basically because the government have implemented a re regulatory structure with benefit us, you know, consumers to buy an electric cars. Not only that it is cheap, but also on the, all the benefits that we can go in the, on, in the bus line, free parking and, and other benefits. And that is the way policymakers, governments, politicians need to work with the regulatory regime in order to accelerate the uptake and implementation of the new solutions. Because the climate crisis is quite serious. And we need to speed up. And the market is not quick enough to do this alone. So we need government, we need brave politicians, and we need, obviously, in order for them to be elected and re-elected, a much broader crisis awareness uh, among people. Uh, otherwise, these brave politicians will not be elected. So this is not only about politicians or about business. It's also, again, about how ordinary people see that this future is a better future future for all with more jobs for all which give more benefits for all and a more fair future for all and that's why i think it's so important also for politicians to make really inspiring pointed visions on where we are heading so you talk there about the importance of brave leadership and that I think is something that is probably needed in all kinds of decisions right now in the world. You know, taking taking confident, bold steps towards perhaps uh, different decisions, different ideas, different opportunities because of the times that we're in. To what extent do you see brave leadership as being critical to the the transition towards a greener future? Well, I think it is essential. Uh, but let me give a few reflection on brave leadership, because I think today brave leadership is not about top management having all the ideas and pushing that through uh, the organization. Brave leadership today with very high density of, of technology change and other changes is really leaders also listen to their organization, to leaders who dare to involve the organization, leaders who dares to put up questions to their own organizations, to the customers and to the suppliers. So brave leadership is leaders that dare to put the finger on the problems, to, that would like to put themselves in the middle of a big supply chain, invite customers, suppliers, employees to work together to solve these problems. Because many of the problems today are systemic problems. So they are too big for one company to solve along. Uh, you normally need the whole supply chain to be involved in order to really make a difference. Sometimes leaders need to reach out to companies uh, in other business sectors than their own, uh, also because that can support them in solving more of the systemic um, challenges. And, and, and in shift, uh, that is one of our strong points, uh, is that we have companies and leaders from different business sectors coming together. And we do projects where we blend competences, leadership from different business sectors to make projects together. So, yes, 
leadership is to be clear in communication about the challenges, clear in communication about the directions, but also very humble in the way they uh, invite uh, all the stakeholders in order to be, uh, be engaged in, in solving their problems. And you mentioned there a number of projects that you're working on with these brave leaders involved in the SHIFT network. And one of those projects is the Circular Economy Project. Can you tell us a little bit about what's involved in that and why you're working on that particular project right now. Yeah, uh, I, I, am, I love circular economy. I love the thinking. And uh, to be honest about to, to you, I was not that interested in that topic a few years back. But the more I've learned about it, the more powerful I see the concept is today. Because basically, uh, you know, for the last hundred years, <clears throat> our economy has been designed in the way that we produce a lot of stuff and then we just throw it away. So, so the whole economy is based on very linear principles. But again, if you take uh, inspiration from nature, in nature it's no waste. Na nature is much more sophisticated designed in the way that everything is into circular models. And if you look at how we today, for instance, count climate emissions, it's very simplified. It's too simplified. In Norway, we only count the emissions that we are emitting in Norway. But Norway is one of the countries in the world which use most resources. So we import a lot of goods from other countries. And we also export 10 times more emissions from our oil and gas activity than we emit uh, in, in Norway. So circular economy is a way to get a much more holistic view on how we use resources. And I think also it gives a lot of advantages for companies that use these principles in the way they develop products, in the way that they develop services. It's definitely going more into uh, business models where you, you, you do sharing, uh, you go from selling products to selling services. So it's a lot of opportunity to redesign your business model when you look at circular models. And I think it is so powerful. And that's why we do together with other organization in Norway, a gap analysis on Norway. We would like to see how circular Norway is. Today, the world is 9% circular. And the preliminary results from our analysis show that Norway is about 7% circular. But we are still working with this analysis. And um, uh, later this spring, we will we'll release the report. And, and obviously, then we can um, compare Norway to other European countries and we can learn from other countries. And most importantly, we will take these results into the business community and see how the business community can contribute in order to make Norway more circular and the way we consume resources much more efficiency, efficient. Because going forward, resource efficiency will be a very, very critical uh, part of decarbonize, decarbonize the world and reaching a more sustainable future. And I know that with your background in DNBGL, you've also been pushing for a green and maritime sector. Uh, could you tell me a little bit or help our audience understand a little bit more about the Green Fleet project? Yeah, so basically we have taken inspiration for what's going on in the maritime sector. In that sector, we, we really use the coast of Norway as a laboratory for green solutions. And it's basically a kinder egg in the sense that by doing so, we reduce the emissions in Norway. We create jobs in Norway to build the green solutions, the green ships, the battery system and so on and so forth. And we strengthen all the companies in Norway, in the sector, because the rest of the world will follow us and are already 
following us. So, so, so by doing this very uh, focused on the coast of Norway, uh, we do this together with the Norwegian government, with all the um, uh, companies in the sector, and we have a common vision of making the coast of Norway the most efficient and environmentally friendly uh, coast when it comes to seaborne transportation. So that is the backdrop. And in shift, we basically have a vision to, to kind of extend this to the whole of Norway, where we say that we would like to make Norway as a showcase of sustainable solutions in many sectors, because we think when we do something in one sector, that inspires other sectors. So for instance, what we do in the maritime sector give a lot of inspirations to other sectors. And the Green Fleet project we are doing now is more focused on uh, land-based transportation. Uh, we have done the project in different phases. So obviously we have we are looked at small, how we can increased uptake of small uh, cargo vehicles. And now our focus is to see how we can uh, increase the uptake of um, zero emissions truck and buses. Because we see many of the companies in shift are struggling to reach their climate targets because the market doesn't offer enough uh, solutions for, um, for more heavy vehicle within zero emissions, either electric, hydrogen solutions or other solutions. So, so that is the real uh, focus and uh, we, we think we can, can succeed. Uh, much of this is really to, to work together and to communicate how the market will be, meaning that, you know, how much these companies are willing to invest if the solutions are there and then work with the government to make sure they put in good incentive structure so the business sectors are able to do the investments and also that it is predictability in 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 in, in the an investment now we know that that will will last for years ahead so very excited about the green project very proud of what Norway are doing on the maritime sector. And I think, you know, the combination of this is also to inspire the building sector in Norway, as we have discussed the aviation sector, the food sector, and all the sectors, because we really need to work across all sectors in order to succeed making Norway this showcase of sustainable solutions make a robust business sector in Norway and definitely move fast enough towards a low uh, um, carbon future. And I know when reading around what SHIFT is really um, pushing for, it's this idea of being a do tank rather than a think tank. So tell, tell us a little bit more about what that really means for businesses as you're encouraging them to take action going forward. Yeah, so, so thank you. That is a very important point for us. And, um, um, you know, I think, to be honest, I think we have enough knowledge in the world. Uh, I think we have plenty of reports. I don't think we need that much more reports. I think, you know, we, we have most of that, that report. And we have most of the insights in what it takes to move to a low carbon futures. Definitely we have discussion about priorities and means of coming there, but, but the knowledge is there enough. So, so, so that's why uh, SHIFT is a business-led initiative. Uh, we don't want to be a think tank. We think it is enough think tanks out there. We don't want to just produce uh, reports because basically we think it's enough reports as well. What we want to do is to make real change. And, and that is what business really can do because that is what business is all about. So that's why we organize our work through what we call is uh, pilots. Uh, we talked about Green Fleet today. We also have a pilot on, on Svalbard, but we want to transfer the Svalbard energy system from 100% fossil to 100% 
renewable. Uh, we, we are doing the, the, the project together on circular economy. And we have totally eight of these um, pilots where companies are using their resources together to you know, solve problems, bring forward solutions, utilizing the competence and the technologies they have. And by doing so, we also see that the communication to um, uh, the government is much easier uh, because then we can we can point on solutions and say that we we propose we do it this way and um, and this is feasible because we have demonstrated this in in this pilot and we see the government is very positive about that that dialogue uh, they really would like to see the business sector guide them in pointing at solutions demonstrate what is is working pilot out the solutions and then we can have a dialogue with them how we can scale them. So that's why we we, we really would like to be, I think, a, a, a do tank. That's why we are a do tank. And uh, we are one more tank, and that is a learn tank. So we are a do and a learn tank because the changes are so quickly now. And then we have to do together and we have to learn together. And that's how we make competitive strength into all the membership companies of SHIFT. And so as we wrap up this very interesting conversation about, you know, how we can really make the most of some of the knowledge that we already have and the competence that we already have and, and take action, as you say, what would you say to businesses now as an advice or a call to action in how they can use the current crisis to move towards a greener future? I would just say that, um, you know, the current crisis is probably a small crisis compared to those two crises we are up front. That is the climate crisis and it is the nature crisis. So this uh, crisis was also a born crisis. Researchers have told us about the likelihood of this crisis for many years. Still, we were not prepared. The scientists are warning us about a climate crisis and a nature crisis. In my opinion, still, we are not prepared. So my call to actions to, to all leaders, but particular business leaders, is to really think through how will you prepare yourself in order to be part of the solution for the climate crisis, for the nature crisis. That is point number one. one. And that is a dialogue leaders need to take with the boards, with their employees, and with the stakeholders. And what I have seen of companies having these dialogues over the last decade is that these companies suddenly see the crisis, the transition, much more as a business opportunity, business threat. So by doing so, you create in your company a culture of being on the right side of history, a culture of looking for opportunity in a low carbon future, a culture of innovation where you use the 17 sustainability goals as innovation platforms, because that is the future we want. And a culture where I think your employees, both those you have today and those who will knock the door uh, in your company the next decade, will be very inspired of working with you. And the second perspective is that, you know, we are in the middle, middle of a huge technology um, development. Part of that is that all business models will be much more transparent as they become more digital. My point is that it's nowhere to hide going forward. Your emissions will be trans, uh, transparent. Your tax positions will be transparent. How you treat your employees will be transparent. All your negative footprint will be transparent. 
So rather start early to prepare yourself for a very transparent uh, future. And finally, it's all about the mindset. I think my generation and our generation has been trained to think, how can we be best in the world? You know, when you look at strategy plans for big company, it is somewhere there in all the plans and we want to be best in the world here and there. I think in order to be really on the right side of history, discuss with your board, how can we be best for the world going forward? And starting the dialogue on that note, I think you will prepare yourself to make you robust for the future we have ahead of us. Bjorn, thank you for closing out this conversation on a very powerful message and call to action to businesses and their boards. I really hope they take that to heart and get doing and are brave, as you put it. So with that, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for watching the ONS Energy Talks. You can watch our streams at two o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays on ons.no.